Hi everyone, I'm here with Kevin Prone and Kevin Still today, the two Kevins. Kevin Prone is a Chief Security Architect for Fornet, and Fornet in the, the cyber and security space. And Kevin Still is Director of Kevin Still Consulting and Demsa. And we know Kevin pretty pretty well. So both of you guys, welcome and thanks thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Nice to be, nice to be. So I suppose this this discussion has started off based on a couple of events and Kevin, I'd heard you speak um, a little bit around cybersecurity and some of the things that shocked me were, was just for, as the average person in the street, you, you know about it, but what I didn't realise is just how much it's escalating in the last couple of years. And I think it was exacerbated to a certain extent. I actually went to the, the British Library the other day and obviously they, they'd had a cyber attack and they had a ransomware mm -hmm. attack as well. And so it's sort of like, like top of mind. Have, how has the, the dynamics around cybersecurity, in particular, it's like, probing of networks and how's that changed over the last couple of years because it feels like it's escalating oh yeah it's certainly uh, escalating and and we're we're seeing that trend i think one of the first sort of pinch points that really started was covid obviously there was a lot more use of digital media and and enabling digital journeys happen quite quickly during covid so i think we quote five to seven years of digital transformation done in two or three weeks sometimes you know, two or three months mm -hmm. and what's happened uh, as a result of that awareness has improved so people are a little bit more aware now of the scaremongering that goes around the market so you only had to worry about when we were waiting for our covid tests and suddenly we're starting to see sms's coming through saying that we've been somebody with with somebody that was potentially um, infected and therefore we'd very quickly start moving towards those digital channels of engagement because the NHS app enabled us to get access to this. Typically, I think we've seen a, a massive in, increase in that. I think we've also seen a, a massive increase in cyber attacks due to, the, let's just say, that the state that the globe's in at the moment. So we've seen a lot of nation state attacks actually happening, and those nation state attacks have now been monetized and start moving down into corporate attacks because I think one of the biggest things we've seen in terms of acceleration is things like AI and machine learning and toolkits that enable people with a cause or not a just cause but in their mind a cause to be able to wreak havoc quite quickly with a relatively small amount of knowledge so we've seen a massive increase of that we've also seen a massive shift as a result of the digital transformation journeys that people are having. So moving to contactless, so more seeing your doctors online, more engaging digitally with a service organisation than maybe face to face. And I guess as a result of that, we've seen an increase in that sort of use of digital technology. The increase also is based around monetization. So mm -hmm attackers, ethical hackers like myself, would sit there and demonstrate how we could infiltrate an organization from the outside. And the idea was that we were demonstrating where those issues were for the good of the, those organizations. Now, I think if you imagine now there's downloadable kits to enable you to be particularly sophisticated online, and with a couple of minutes in YouTube or a couple of hours in YouTube, I'm being a bit flippant there, a couple of hours in YouTube, you can actually use these tools to start um, getting money and extorting money from individuals. So it is really, really interesting. I think the challenge we've seen is that still the secure thinking inside organizations hasn't caught up. There's this sort of a psychological view of not me, it's going to be somebody else. And we, I've worked on four or five high profile cyber attacks in, in the last two or three years that I can mention that have really started to open eyes of individuals as to the breadth and depth of the problem. How much do you think that the pandemic and I suppose digital readiness that really came from the pandemic is did we do enough? Did we think about it enough when we were implementing some of these systems? I think, Kevin, you, you mentioned some of that. We almost like felt like we rushed to put some of this stuff in place. And now it feels like almost like we need to go back with some of these new regulatory frameworks that you, you're talking about, Kevin. It's almost like go back and re-implement them just to make sure that they're robust enough. I think it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because we've got to remember with COVID, we really didn't have a lot of choice. We, we were talking about businesses doing what they needed to do to survive. 
and that sort of transformation journey was done pretty quickly. I don't think the regulators would would look at that in the same view. Ultimately, you've still got to you've still got a duty of care. You've still got to be able to do things to a relevant standard. But I think it's give you the the, the typical example: moving um, from an on-premise solution to a a cloud-based solution. Yes, no longer means that you need to be pinned to an office. But what does that mean in terms of the attack surface? Suddenly you had a, a locked office with servers and computers that were inside it, and the only people that could access it were physically sat in that office. Now to an organization where essentially they're cloud-based and you can get access to them from anywhere. So this notion of trust comes into question. When you walk in an office, you scan in, they validate who you are, you log on, they know who you are, you physically sat in a location, CCTV can see you, access control can see you. We know it's you, right? But now when you're consuming an application and you're just a user at the other end of an internet connection, how do we know they are who they say they are? And mm -hmm. equally, the adversaries, how do we know they are who they say they are? So how do you actually know you are interacting with your bank, how do you know you are interacting with the organisation that you know and trust? Yeah, and Kevin, I know you've done quite a bit of work around looking at things like, again, data security, but also like process security. I mean, like, how do we think about how do we get ahead of some of that? What do you think? How do we get ahead of it in terms of the planning? I know it goes through, in terms of, particularly in financial services, we've got greater degrees of regulation, but what do you think are the, the elements around trying to get ahead of that or thinking about it? Because we're not necessarily aware of all the things that, that Kevin was talking about, at least some of the data was showing that, that we're really not aware enough as we need to be. Yeah, it's very rare that you're in a situation that you're a greenfield site and you can do everything from a fair by design, do your record of processing activity, your data processing impact assessments and said, I'm going to design this from ground zero upwards. And that's going to have a combination of all of the, the cyber resilience alongside all of the delivery mechanisms that you want in, in terms of effectively an omni-channel type approach. So recognising that everybody's a, a startup fintech, at best you're likely to be brownfield, but more likely, as Kev's indicated, you've got a mixture of on-prem, in cloud, and there are a few bits that need to be joined together, which probably haven't been looked at in terms of where one entity or one set of data sits versus where the end user engagement may well be. So. It's very difficult if you are in that hybrid environment that, that says you've got an awful lot of money invested in legacy systems. Uh, and so you inev inevitably end up having to build different perimeters. It's like layers of an onion. And um, Kev describes this um, very well when he looks at, do you want to get to 100% resilience and then confirms that's not really achievable, but there are a number of steps that you can take within that. But, but I think you've got to, go through a co-design process that says security and some of the aspects we're looking at now, which is particularly around consumer protection, sit alongside the other elements in terms of in the FCA world, uh, world a consumer enjoying their experience. Mm. Uh, and and two, sometimes that's just not possible. You've got to put friction into journeys and increasing, I do a lot of work in the vulnerability as in vulnerable consumers, but trying to distinguish between a victim and somebody who's a perpetrator is getting increasingly difficult. So you almost have to have a slightly cynical mind when you're going through the design process to look at it and say, which comes first? Ultimately, is it consumer protection? rather than their entire user experience because sometimes something's got to give yeah there's a balance there isn't that we've always been on banking apps where it's so locked down that you end up not being able to do the transaction versus something where it's very easy to be able to do it and you absolutely love it until something goes wrong and then at that point you're like uh, I don't, I'm feeling like I'm exposed and it, especially with that, I suppose the digital kind of like ecosystems we got now we we seem to like particularly over COVID being like trending towards the ease of use rather than the rather than the slight super tight process. How do we get that kind of balance right, do you think? So it is an interesting one, isn't it? Because it's about striking that balance, isn't it? Yeah, you talk about the secure by design principles. Again, a lot of those secure by design principles are built on Greenfield. But 
when I talk about cybersecurity, you, you, you're never really done. It's an iterative process. It's a cycle that you need to apply. Very much like when you're going through an ISO certification, you've got that continual improvement cycle. You've got to have the same sort of cycle baked into everything you do. Mm. And you've got to try and get that right level of, of security to, to validate the app is your app. So getting it on things like the, the Play Store and the Apple Marketplace is a, is almost a tick of validation that they are who they say you are. But we've also got to make sure that anybody can engage on the digital devices that, and the digital channels that they're using. So you've got to be able to protect the consumer and make sure that we are actually talking to the consumer. You've got to start being able to have some form of digital charter or, or digital validation that says, hang on, for instance, inside your online banking, believe it or not, I can't actually set up a new payee without blinking four times in a non-shadowed room for to enable me to set a new payee up. Once that new payee is actually then set up, again, I'm warned by the app that this potentially could be fraudulent and I have to validate who I'm paying and, and where I'm paid. So I think a lot of people, particularly when it's an application that has a lot of impact to it, like online banking. The organizations are building in those secure principles because essentially within banking and finance, there were those always those guards in the first place. The vault was always behind behind locked doors. There were only certain people could get access to the vault, et cetera. So it's building this trust model essentially in your app journeys that you need to make sure the person is who they say they are you're validating them continually so that they are continually validated in case somebody else starts picking up the phone and that you're not just authenticating them once i think that is one of the one of the key elements and is, is there an inclusion angle to that as well so i know we've been talking about digital inclusion as an example and making sure that everyone's included as we put in maybe more controls, is that an aspect, Kevin, that would you think we have to think about? I know we're like talking about your legacy ways of accessing, let's say, financial services, which might be walking in your branch. You've got, we've got digital access, but then if there's new controls that sort of come in place, just making sure that things are safe and secure, then are there potentially exclusion type type considerations you've got to think to in terms of, particularly in terms of gathering information and looking for good outcomes? I think one of the things I'll say, and I'll, I'll let Kev step in at the moment, where we've got things like multi-factor authentication. Mm. On the one hand, at the moment one device, notably your mobile phone, gets compromised, then pretty much everything else gets compromised. But where we are now looking increasingly in the vulnerability world, consumer vulnerability world, is those outliers, maybe the elderly people that live in a rural area that, that don't have access to the branch anymore, and more traditional authentication mechanisms like your, your bank manager recognizing somebody when they walk in and other old fashioned values. Though there are a limited number of people that fit into that outlier piece. And there are a lot of advocates in looking at what happens to people who for one reason or another don't have access to the internet. And, and that might be virtue of financial issues where um, they lose access by virtue of the fact that they miss payments or there might be an outage of power. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at essential services, what actually happens when somebody moves from being potentially vulnerable to critically vulnerable? As Kev has indicated, they may rely on Internet of Things for somebody monitoring their pulse, their, their, their heart rate, whatever. It might be on a dialysis machine uh, and you're having to take readings and those devices inevitably become a weak point in somebody's home security infrastructure and then we get back into another discussion which is what is the right balance between supervising people actually making sure that the right people have the right level of access without some form of unintended consequence which as a result of it one day something breaks down and somebody's left and is found a week later because there's been a you know what might be a minor blip but passes all of the, the sensor and monitoring devices that we have in play. 
how does as, as this sort of the, the surface i think as you describe it uh, kevin as we get all these different kind of iot data connected devices the surface or the landscape increases to a certain extent where's the balance between educating people around this is what you've got to look like versus firms then looking around the security of the devices because there's a bit of a balance there and i was looking through some of your stats around i think 24 percent of staff last lack skills to deal with sophisticated threats as an example i think that was one of the stats that i pulled out but where does the education education piece comes for customers versus making sure as businesses that we've got the threats almost like locked down, particularly as the service increases. Yeah. So from a, the, the corporate's perspective, there are lots of toolkits out there to help get that secure thinking. You've got a lot of things like the ICO, keep people keep people on the, the straight and narrow because of you know the potential fines that come out as a result of any data breaches. So you've got, as a corporate, I think it's almost easier to say we expect layers of security to be in place. We have to have multiple layers in security in place because Kev says, the likelihood of an attack with one layer of security is a lot higher than if you have multiple layers of security. The key other element that I think corporates need to look at is visibility across the piece. You can only you can only manage what you can see. You can only defend what you can see. Actually, getting that balance from the corporate point of view is all down to their risk and the risk they carry. And then you start to think, actually, my technology as a corporate can then be leveraged by a consumer and I can put them potentially in a vulnerable situation without assuming that they know something like multi-factor authentication exists. Mm. So if you start looking at it from a consumer point of view, it's there's lots going on. When we talk about MFA multi-factor authentication, almost everybody that's got a digital device now expects some form of multi-factor authentication. B, that's going to send you a text to say that you've logged on to the phone. You've got to navigate towards the app to validate you are who you say you are. So when you log on to your Google account now, you they're recommending multi-factor authentication is switched on. You authenticate yourself through YouTube or, or through the Google app. So I think there's a general increase in awareness, predominantly because of all the high profile attacks that are happening. But there's still, I think, this view that cybersecurity is a technologist problem. It's not a me problem, it's a you problem. And the IT departments and the corporates need to make sure that we're not that blocker. We're not the department of no. So you've, you've got to try and get that awareness up as much as possible. We we use our cyber awareness platform actually has a great feature in that what it enables you to do is not only go through the training as a corporate user, but also pass and share that expertise on to your friends and family, because everybody wants to be aware of how they can be scammed. And we've got to also remember that there's lots of tricks. We've had the, the fraudsters who have been operating since Victorian times, extracting money from people in various ways. But we've got to realise now, I think, certainly when you start looking at things like digital inclusion, as soon as you introduce technology, it becomes a point where people don't want to engage on those platforms anymore. I still want to go and talk to the bank manager when I want a loan. I'm a technologist and I still want to engage there. They want to engage with me on a, an online call. I actually want to go and sit with people in the branch because I know that's where I need to do my work. When I work with an investment firm, I will always go and work with the investors in their offices because I have a, an inherent distrust of, of the internet and where I put my money. So and that's a bit of a balance. Yeah, that sounds like you've got to have the the right channel for the for, for the right task to a certain extent. So if it's a large amount of money or a very complicated decision, that's the one you want to have almost like in person. Whereas some of the more transactional pieces, maybe you can have that more more digital. Having said that, I think one of the other pieces that, that Kevin, you were making me think of was when you have lots of different channels and they all interlink, let's say it's a, a, a device in your kitchen that actually you know records videos, as an example, if that's not properly secure, then you can actually gather information to then access a completely different different device or completely different service from even from a different company and I suppose it's like the link the ability to be able to link those together becomes very powerful and there's actually a risk for consumers and as businesses we've probably got to think ahead of some of that. I think one of the things that Peb's highlighted in the events that we've done through the course of March is 
people aren't tremendously good at coming up with innovative passwords. And indeed, if they've come up with one innovative password, that's likely to be rare. They're likely to be tied around the, the pet's name with a year added and perhaps an exclamation mark added to the end of it. So if there is a point of weakness, you've only got to look at it and say, are the transactions going through this of any meaningful value? Probably not. But it's when you escalate through and said, right now I've gained access to a number of different levels. And I think we made reference in the events to the film, the, the Beekeeper, that's at the moment where a simple scam gets in where there's an expectation of maybe taking a few thousand dollars from somebody and they suddenly find there's a pension trust fund behind, but everything's got the same password uh, and the ripple effect takes takes on. And I'm constantly reminded of this, that not only do people often have the same password, but they keep them in public view, either on a post-it note or in a book very adjacent to the device you access to rob all the money. So there are many facets of this that where consumer education is key. Just today, I've had from one of my credit card providers a reminder of the things they won't do, which I think is very important. It's a message that Kev talks about all the time. But I think in the world we're in at the moment, where there is a risk that people do the wrong things, don't make the right choices on it, that there has to be a balance to protect both sides, the commercial entity, if somebody does something really stupid, uh, and consumers themselves who may well have been duped into doing something in good faith, thinking they're dealing with a trusted provider. I think Me. it gets interesting as well when you you start looking at risk. As a consumer going along, I bought my first Alexa device. I thought it was really cool many years ago, put it into the house and then started to play with it and started to use technologies like if this, then that. So decision-based automation engines. And I started to very quickly disable the Alexa devices in my home because people don't necessarily have a view of risk. Again, you look at things like AI, everybody's now using AI to do their homework. I had to correct my son more than on two occasions where he's going, I can just ask chat GPT and it's going to write it. Yeah. Think about the implications of what you're doing. So I think big people are becoming more aware if you're in that digital, if you've been growing up as born in the 2000s, then you almost embrace this technology and use it without the same sense of fear that maybe I do in, in my early 50s, knowing what I do for a living. I embrace these new technologies, but you've got to try and get people mindful that there are risks. But to back to Kev's point, the risks, the controls need to be proportional to the risk. And this is where some of the technologist terminology, the, the process of using a framework like NIST now enables you to pick tiers. So a, a control can be proportional to the risk you carry and the bigger the impact of that technology going wrong, the more controls you need to put around it. So we don't want to dry, drop digital innovation. We want to make sure that we support that, but we want to make sure that we're doing it to a driving test standard, if you like, of digital resilience. I just remember from my days running a fraud department was just like, it, it's the, the criminals or organized crime or the fraudsters seem to be like they invest in this as a business as well and they seem to be like one step ahead and almost like getting a being faster to get to some of these things than businesses can get to and I suppose that there's that kind of aspect in terms of like just the acceleration of it but then it's also strikes me just what you're saying it's also a little bit around the human factor of it as well which is they'll play on our psychology because some of these scams these days are really they're really persuasive. And if they play on that, oh, you've missed something or we've just done it, we've just done a delivery or, or those kind of things. And it plays on your fears and eight fears, doesn't it, to a certain extent? Yeah, it does. It does. Human psychology is a big hobby of mine and something I'm really passionate about. But there's things like authority bias. At the end on revenue, say your tax returns are valid. It has to be done now. You're going to be fined. Now with things like ChatGPT, they've actually got the language right. It's a lot more believable. They're using bitly links and people obviously use bitly links. We use it in LinkedIn all the time, don't we? You don't want a big link. We'll give you a bitly link and click on the link. So we're seeing that happening more and more. And it's starting to get really concerning when you start to look at it from that perspective. I think one thing I see, Chris, is that 
Keb talks about a number of different types of attacks and the motives for them. You can probably understand where something's got a commercial intent to it. But I think where it is deliberately designed almost to be a sort of guerrilla attack and that there is a machismo to it around I've proven that I can do this or I do it for other reasons that are more destructive, where particularly when you're going down to a non-corporate level to individuals and just how devastating that can be on people's lives. Mm -hmm. That to me is where it's very difficult to apply human psychology to that sort of guerrilla type tactic where you are probably just unfortunate or unlucky in some instances and protecting against that for most consumers there is an expectation that the infrastructure providers are going to be there to help them mm -hmm. so some of the recent fca activity again going back to the sort of duty has been around critical service providers your likes of aws your azures your big broadband providers etc that there is an expectation that they are culpable in some manner to provide some layer of security even if we're talking about how do you access the internet at home what your basic firewall configuration is most people still don't believe on a smartphone that you have to have virus protection in the same way as you do on your pc there are so many myths and legends that we have to deal with but somewhere within that critical service provision there should be a sort of minimum level of hygiene that you can detect that you just can't transact safely at the moment if you're not doing the following and i'm right in saying that it's because it's not just your business it's also your entire supply chain you've got to be aware of as well so because they can come in at the end of your weakest link be it right at the end of the supply chain which might be like distance as far as you're concerned but that can then ripple all the way through uh, and that's happened very recently with things like the progress move it letter shops that were producing critical personal data on behalf of big banks but they were the supplier of the supplier where the Information Commission is very clear. Everybody should have uh, an intercompany agreement of so the same level of quality as the primary agreement. Mm -hmm. But that often isn't the case. So what we end up finding was millions of letters with personal information being acquired through a, an attack. And then the ripple goes all the way back to saying, who's the data controller? It's you, Mr. Tier 1 Bank. Mm -hmm. It is interesting when you look at supply chain because, you know, it's quite popular. People think that the, the attacks actually come from the outside in. We're trying to exfiltrate data from the outside in. But again, these principles of secure thinking, one of the things I always am very close to my heart is, is zero trust. You need to make sure that you're giving people the minimum level of access to do the job that they need to do. And also in your supply chain that you are making sure that the connectivity and the conversations or the transactions that are going through that supply chain are as secure as they need to be on a needs to know basis. Mm -hmm. You've only got to look at the SolarWinds attack. SolarWinds being a tool that was used to monitor networks and servers. Lots of managed service providers use them and use this software in their service offering. And overnight, SolarWinds themselves were compromised, which meant that everybody that had SolarWinds and hadn't got the appropriate controls in place, which we had at the time, were potentially compromised. It's one of those interesting conversations where you need to start thinking about the entire supply chain, the entire digital journey, and making sure that those controls are appropriate. So when we're managing a customer, and those customers want us to look after them from a security point of view, we're not going to have a one-to-one -one relationship directly with the customer. We're monitoring and defending that customer to keep them secure. We have to connect to them to enable us to do so. We have to make sure that there's secure channels and secure agreements to allow that intercommunication to happen and not necessarily allow malware or ransomware or uh, somebody from the inside, over 75% of attacks actually happen from the inside of the network to move laterally across into your supply chain and attack them via you. So it can be quite scary. How do we start thinking about 
AI as large language. There's developments that have taken place in terms of large language models. Particularly look at things like multi-factor authentication, some of the authentication methods that, that are out there. It feels like we're on the cusp of almost like being able to replicate humans or human interaction as a result through through the computer. If you can do it not just once, you don't have to employ people to do it, you can actually just get the computer to do it. So be it cloning voices as an example, I think was was one of the ones I think I'd heard I'd heard you use before. But it could also be video phones, it can be all sorts of things now where it's really becoming quite convincing. I think Kev's talked about, he's talked about it earlier on with Alexa and Google. Mm. Potentially you can be used that to actually develop all the voice prints you want until you've got a, a big enough. So mm. so most of these fishing trips aren't fly fishing by J.R. Hartley anymore. That's not one strike and you've caught your fish. It's very patient. And what I've been impressed with when Kev talks about their approach, there's a lot of reconnaissance work that goes on in advance of this. That that can be on a large scale and, and multiple victims, probably thousands of victims concurrently being worked on. It makes it really believable at the end of the day. And you only need about 30 minutes of a voice to to create a, a reliable clone of an individual. There's places that you can go on the internet. Obviously, I won't quote them here, but the places that you can go to download a, a digital face, which is highly convincing developed and delivered by AR models. And then you can automate that. So essentially you sit there with a camera, it takes the it takes the model and it stitches your facial expressions and everything together. My voice is my password. Be very worried because mm. they, that, that, that can be very successful. And other things now is believability. I have a digital chart with my partner now where I, I say, well, I will not interact with you in a certain way. And I will never ask you to do certain things in certain ways. And if you do, you, we need to have a sort of secret handshake so that we can authenticate we are who we say you are. Because mm. if you think about it, lots of people are putting a lot of what they do out onto Facebook and, and Twitter and Snapchat. And essentially, they're putting videos out there. So those videos can be used to train those models. And then you can create a very convincing version of yourself saying i've broken down i need to need to put myself into a hotel i'm probably not going to be able to get back from weeks because europe can you send me five thousand pounds mm. and before you've engaged with that person you've actually transferred to five thousand pounds it wasn't the individual that who said they are so you when i talk about the digital charters banks are a really good example of this is like kev says credit card companies saying what they won't do Again, you need to design those into your own sort of secret handshakes and, mm. and secret authentications that you've needed. Do, do you think it's going to almost revert back to like in-person meetings? So you talked a, bit, a, bit, a little bit earlier around meeting a bank account. Do you think it's we've almost gone so far towards digital and the fact that this other threats coming in from the outside? Do you think we're going to have to say, look, there are some things where I mean, because the one of the ways you can actually trust that you're talking to a human is by meeting them physically i mean not even talking on a video I, I could be just i could actually just be an ai here sitting interviewing you guys but the one way you can trust that is the fact that we've met and that, that meeting and almost like that cone of silence to a certain way if you, if you remember that is one way of guaranteeing that trust is there do you think we're going to start to see some of those things come back i think to a certain degree we're too far down that digital journey to go back to obviously things uh, that that deal with national security of course those things have to happen because it's proportional for the risk that's carried but i think there's a lot to be said in the advancements of digital validation so being able to authenticate you are who you say you are via digital means i think we'll see significant improvement in multi-factor authentication multi-factor authentication is seen as the nirvana but we all know and uh, i actually do a, a a demo on this where we can actually uh, steal the cookie session of an individual's um authentication so essentially what we do is we get you to sign into office 365 via a phishing mail once you authenticate i've actually got remote control of your machine and then i'll pick up your authentication cookie which when you log into things like Microsoft 365, you're authenticated for a certain period of time before you're asked to log on again. So if I can pick that up and I can then inject that digitally again, 
mm. we have an issue. Essentially, mm. multi-factor authentication is torn down. So there's lots of different digital methods that are now being employed. Not only do I want multi-factor authentication, but I want to check that it's on the phone that's registered as trusted. It's in a location that I would expect the phone to be in. It has certain digital footprint on that phone to validate it is who it says it is. So yeah. again, it's just using more of those layers of technology for that digital validation. And it's striking the balance between validating them and friction. Yeah. And, and Kevin, when we start to think about governance around some of this and like making sure we're staying ahead of this, because it sounds like the, the landscape's completely changing all the time and having a good governance framework can help you stay ahead of it. I mean, terms of either flagging the risk won't solve everything, but at least take, staying ahead of it. What, what, how do we think about that with particularly in the current environment with all of the, the regulations that are coming out? What's the best kind of governance frameworks do you think are to have out there? This is a strange one because the FCA, so if you are a, an FCA regulated firm, they like statements of responsibility. They don't like shared responsibility. And there are some prescribed responsibilities, which include things like financial crime. Mm -hmm. So within an organization of any size, there will be somebody who's designated to look after that. Conversely, you can have virtually anybody you want as the data protection officer. And indeed, many firms don't even require to have a DPO. And many that still are a DPO in their firm are in an antiquated old world when you had a branch network. And this is what you did with data in filing cabinets and the like, rather than in the world that we're actually in now. So this whole concept of this, particularly the cyber area, should this align more with the chief risk officer? Should it more align with the chief technology officer, chief information officer, and indeed you may not have all three of those roles. And then from an accountability point of view, how is that reported on at regular board meetings? If I look at it relative to somebody like who's a money laundering reporting officer or a compliance officer, they normally have a designated role and they're meant to have a reporting slot every board meeting. But it'd be interesting to see with Kev's role and the audits he does, and I know he talks to a lot of boards where you're looking at things like the new NIST, NIST 2 requirements, who you're facing off to when you're speaking to the board around this is your problem, because it isn't intuitive. Uh, and I think increasingly these roles are changing now within, I think, the NIST 2 framework, Kev, that you'll talk about in a second. Governance is a major factor in that and probably the starting point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Governance is a major factor. And like you say, Kevin, it's baking in that responsibility to the board so that security is seen as baked into the fabric of everything you do. I do spend a lot of time with boards and based on some of the new regulations that are coming out around the European directive of NIST2, really interesting and that fines are getting so big now that they're, they're holding people personally liable for data breaches. So I think it's getting there. I think the the issue that we always have as technologists is that we need to speak the language of the board and the language of the board is essentially risk with mitigations and, and controls. And then ultimately, it's the board's decision as to their risk appetite. Um, but ultimately, more and more governance is going to be coming in mandating the way they they look at that. Security is something for a lot of organizations that's done when you join the firm, you, you have a security induction, um, you're given your pass, you're told what not to do and what not to do. And then your cyber awareness training is done an induction. You've got to start thinking about the secure processes that you're doing in a, when you're bringing on a new product, you're discussing it within um, a board meeting. It's hang on. How do we know that we're not opening ourselves up to a new channel of attack? We're launching a new digital app via this, and now how 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 um, um, resilient is that digital journey going to be? I have one organisation that I have close links to, who essentially were responsible for issuing one-time passwords. So when you log on to your online banking, you'll sometimes be given a one-time password sent 
via a text and you put that one time password into the app. An app was actually compromised that utilized one time passwords and there was a massive bill generated to the one time password vendor. Well, whose fault's that? Let alone where the risk is um, in terms of it can end up these one time passwords can end up in the wrong hands because SMS is incredibly easy to um, mm -hmm. mimic. There's a number of things that boards need to be thinking about, and really they should have an ongoing view of the digital risks that they're carrying at the board meeting as well. And, and that's particularly clear now within the FCA regime under consumer duty. So every product is meant to have its own product assurance framework. So when you look at that and even existing products should have gone back through the process of being effectively reapproved. Now, if you work on the basis in one of the spaces I work in, which is debt advice, that around 93, 94% of the audience will have access to the internet, 84% to a smartphone, that's got to be intrinsically involved in that process. And where sludge creeps in is it's incredibly easy to onboard a client, but the back end technology doesn't live up to the front end technology and it doesn't use any of those tools on the back end. It goes back to quill pen technology. So there needs to be a consistency throughout the journey where you almost use that onboarding process to educate the consumer who may be regarded as financially vulnerable around the risks and building that trust right up front of this is what we will do, this is what we won't do, and that we're going to build that going forward. And I just, at the moment, still don't see that as an integral part of what people have done through the duty implementation, gone down to that granular level and said, I'm going to unpick my product that may have been around since the dawn of time and think about what this means to Mr. Consumer. What does vanilla look like? What does good look like? And that includes payment methods, your opening times. If you are closing the branch or restricting when the telephones are available, what happens out of hours? And does that then create a risk in terms of if you're engaging because you are in an emergency situation and that you find the channel you deal with at the weekend is nowhere near as robust as the one that you're dealing with during the week? So there's a lot more you've got to think about when you go through a product assurance framework. And I think security and engagement, trust building are integral parts of that proposition. I mean, it very much feels like the, the fire or the heat is being turned up on this as, as we go through. And it sounds like cyber security is something else we've also got to think through in terms of all of the, the resilience piece. And it, the, the temperature just keeps on increasing and probably multiplying or even exponentially increasing to a certain extent. Where do, where do you think, what do you think the big watch charts are in the next sort of year, 18 months? What do you got to think about now? And where, where do you think we're going to go from here? What are the big things that keep you awake at night? And Kevin, maybe just start first. Kevin still. So... I'm going to go back to basics, really, and I think the fact that we are seeing such an inextricable journey towards digital, or at least a partial digital journey in almost everything you do. Finding a telephone number, even online now, for some of your core providers is nigh on uh, impossible. So there's a gigantic push in that particular way, and consumers aren't necessarily being brought along with the journey. So I am fearful where I am being told my journey's better on an app, that I've got to go and sign on the portal or doing this yourself is perfectly feasible, but they don't engender that trust as you're going along. So I, I am, for one, get very anxious if I'm doing something that is new, even if somebody changes their website allegedly for the better, it's a journey I don't recognise and therefore I'm often nervous about how I go about, you know, going ahead. I want a bit of reassurances as I go through. But a lot of corners seem to be cut. That discussion we had around COVID, where things had to be rushed through, there should have been periods where things were unwound and then done correctly afterwards. Because I think there are still loopholes in many systems, whether they be central government or the private sector, and this concept of omni-channel versus multi-channel, I still think there are an awful lot of journeys that have been bodged together. Uh, and inevitably, you can almost see it and said, somebody's bolted this on to the side, mm. whether it be a bot chat 
web chat or something similar, this doesn't look like it's integrated and therefore there's a potential weakness here where I don't feel like I'm going through the same authentication process that I perhaps would go through going through another channel. It does very much feel like the, I mean, this conversation is very much highlighting the risks are there as a result of not doing some of those things. Kevin, what's your kind of view on the near and midterm futures? Your near and midterm futures are, are, are quite scary if, if your your digital journeys aren't keeping pace with the, the pace at which the, the cyber attacks are increasing. We're now you know, conscious of the fact that things like AI and machine learning, coupled with the advance of things like quantum computing, enable us to do things at a tremendous rate. What I think is happening now is that technology is advancing so quickly with like voice cloning, video cloning and this type of technology, you, you're beginning to get to a point where the pace at which the attacks are happening, you're going to struggle to uh, keep up with the defensive requirements that you need to keep yourself secure without implementing those appropriate controls now. We see it a lot in the when we talk about you're only as good as your weakest link, we've got a massive acceleration in number of attacks that's happening. We've got a massive simplification in the way to exploit an attack. You can actually buy a ransomware on demand now directly off the dark web. So you take a particular dislike to a corporate, you can pay a fee, normally in bitcoins, and then they will release their ransomware to you. That ransomware will be able to be executed really quickly because they're using things like video to actually train the individuals and helping them do that. And then the pace and sophistication of attacks that are happening now, it's no longer the very basic attacks that are easy to spot. So I think when we were talking about what the work we do in contact center, a lot of the simple work has been taken away. A lot of what we're doing now is complex. Now, a lot of complexity can be done at speed. And that's the challenge, I think. And the thing to be looking out for as you're designing these digital journeys and as you're looking at your risk profile is making sure that you're engaging with people that can give you that right level of risk. There's a lot of fear out there. There is a lot of fear. The only way really to be secure is to turn it all off, put it back in the box and send it back to the vendor. That's one level of secure thinking. But essentially, we've got to have those proportional controls in place and organisations have got to invest in that ongoing defence of their cybersecurity posture because the pace at which things are happening is accelerating. The complexity is being reduced for the adversaries. The number of vectors that we need to be vigilant on is increasing exponentially. And we need to make sure that we keep pace with that by defending everything we can with the proportional controls. Yeah. And that comes at a cost, Chris. And I think when you look in, in the regulatory space, we do a lot of work with debt buyers, debt collectors, as well as debt advice firms who are inherently small in the grand scheme of things relative to big insurance firms and banks. So the cost of things like cyber insurance is disproportionately high. The cost of your core infrastructure to do your core business, which is collecting money, be readily compromised relative to people that put highly sophisticated tools in place. So one of my fears on the other side, the corporate side, is that for, for small and medium sized firms, the cost of entry and maintenance of your position to cover this immense landscape where you are doing things that are fundamental to your business which is getting paid uh, and that those monies can get easily misdirected elsewhere we don't know where that's going to end up what i do know is whenever we look at bidding where the government wants one third of all spend to be with an sme but you've got to get through all of these hoops of fire to get there it means you almost can't be an SME to jump through the hoops of fire sometimes because you need every ISO accreditation under the sun, plus insurances that are disproportionately large to typically what you would have had to have several years ago. And the interesting quandary then is that the insurance may not pay out. So we've actually seen that ourselves where firms have been compromised and the insurance won't actually pay out because they expect that level of uh, digital resilience that you've said in your application form to be present. If 
say, endpoint security software was something that you said was my mitigation for this attack, and it's found not to be on there, then you're nullifying your, your claim, potentially. Mm. So it, I, I think this is where, when I'm working with boards, there's a lot of tick box exercises that happen. I've done that. I'm Cyrus Sanchez Plus. I've done that. I've done that. I've ticked those, all those boxes. But you need to start scraping a little bit below those tick box exercises and, and look how deep and how wide those controls go because the insurers certainly will. And the premiums are getting more and more expensive for a reason. They're paying out more and more. So they're wanting more and more proportional controls to be in place. One firm that we've actually been working with recently were described as uninsurable. That was how bad, particularly in, in, in the finance sector, they were viewed. Now, that was disproportionate. You've got to look at some of the technology that's been used by the insurers, insurers, I should say, to assess risk. They themselves are now using tools that predominantly I'd have been using five or six mm -hmm. years ago now to assess risk. They're an insurance company. So there's a massive push now to making security something that you do and practice every day and it becomes part of the very everyday fabric of of your organization yeah. i know this the, the whole topic's been a bit of an eye-opener for me just in terms of talking about some of these kind of issues and just let's say how much is accelerating but kevin and kevin thanks very much for joining me and helping helping illustrate it over the over today but also the, the last few weeks as well i really appreciate it so hopefully it's, it's interesting for folks because it feels like it's something that definitely has to be top of mind thanks very much